next ritual space I want to talk about is the labyrinth. There are actually two labyrinth traditions, a southern labyrinth tradition and a northern labyrinth tradition. And both traditions use the labyrinth in a very different way. So in the northern labyrinth tradition, the labyrinths are in a way, um, could say, a road through the cosmos. So the heart of the labyrinth is, you could say, the, the divine, the that highest self, the highest state of awareness. And while walking the labyrinth, you're in a way trying to find your way to God, to the Absolute, to the Creator. And what exactly that yeah, divine spark is, is defined by every labyrinth. So every labyrinth is different in this respect. So some labyrinths are solar labyrinths, others are lunar labyrinths, others are star labyrinths. And they ultimately lead you through different layers of energy to the very core of what they represent the sun, the moon, a star, a planet. And by walking these labyrinths, you slowly but surely train yourself, train your energy body to work with those energies. So a labyrinth of this kind is very much of an initiatory nature. You try to find out what are all the manifestations and what is the essence of the thing which is, yeah, uh, the labyrinth is representing. So the labyrinth, you could say, is almost um, uh, a copy in a physical form of a higher energy. So also an egregore can be symbolized by a labyrinth where you start at the lower levels of the egregore barely feeling its energy and its emanations and slowly but surely you start to understand the higher principles of the egregore and the heart of the egregore and you may even encounter uh, the angel which is guiding the egregore or leading the egregore. So it's a very much a symbolism for uh, going deeper within the external structure. The charging of the labyrinth is usually done by the composition. So labyrinths can be made of various materials. They can be made of rock, they can be made of stones, which are just placed in a pattern. When, but you can also use sticks or branches to place them in such a pattern or you can use uh, paint, you can use flowers, living flowers, living plants to create a pattern like this. And depending on the materials which go in its composition, it will also attract different energies. Um, another way to do it is also to put the names of the different powers you want involved in the labyrinth in the different walls. So every uh, in different places as you go in you would put the names of things with the appropriate powers which you will meet along your way. And this is a very defined labyrinth. You can see the path. But some labyrinths can be very chaotical. Um, if you look at Avebury, for instance, there you have different stones and every stone is also charged with a certain power. And by walking the stones in a certain order, you can get to a certain place of awareness. And if you use the same space in a different order, you get to either nowhere or confusion or to places with a very other kind of awareness. So these are really the mystical labyrinths um, where you, in a way, just like in the physical world, you're wandering around almost blindly and groping around trying to find uh, the right people, the right books, the right lessons, the right teachers to help you in your spiritual growth. And even if you do find the right person or the right thing happens to you, it is very difficult to grasp 
how it all fits into the pattern, how to understand its significance for you on your spiritual path. So many labyrinths are not completely filled out, but are in a way yeah, very much blank with certain spots of power in it, with certain cores in it. And by using your intuition, you can walk the points in the right order to get to where you want to be. Um, these labyrinths from the Northern Labyrinth tradition, uh, they're also often uh, preparation. Uh, the person gets to know the power, gets to know the cosmos. And once they are skilled enough at maneuvering the labyrinth, at working with all the different aspects of the energy, um, then they are become ready for initiation into priesthood. In this tradition, it is also um, very essential, not just that you walk in and feel the things, but also that you allow yourself to be transformed while walking the labyrinth. So while you're walking, every space can touch you, can transform you. And this transformation can happen naturally. So you can walk around in the labyrinth and suddenly you find yourself being different. Or it can also be guided. You can walk a labyrinth with a certain intention, with a certain desire. And this will um, determine how you will use the energies, how you will use the things which are given to you within the labyrinth. And that will determine your transformation. So having a motto, a desire, a goal when walking a labyrinth can really help to focus the effects of the labyrinth space. The labyrinth space is also a very safe space to use in all your rituals or in all your healings. Um, because the labyrinth itself cannot be maneuvered by a spirit or a being which is too simple, too stupid to work with it, to understand it. So spirits from lower dimensions tend not to be found in labyrinth spaces. Only spirits from higher worlds tend to live in labyrinth space. So a labyrinth by its very nature tends to have a high vibration. You can also um, combine a labyrinth for instance with uh, a family constellation which is a healing method where also a person is placed in the center and different people are placed around it representing different family members, different powers, different forces. And the family constellation is actually a modern version of the Southern Labyrinth tradition. In the Southern Labyrinth tradition, people were not so much just trying to experience the cosmos, but they were trying to experience themselves. They were trying to find out who they were, to get self-control to really find also all their hidden sides, all their subconscious motives, all their instincts, all their past lives. They really sought to gain deeper understanding of themselves. And the labyrinth in the Southern tradition is not a map of the cosmos, but it's a, it's a map of yourself, of your own subconscious. The principle is still the same, that going in with a certain intention is very beneficial, is very helpful because it will help you to find and to recognize the spots which are of importance to you, which are of essence to you. If you walk in the southern labyrinth without a goal, without a purpose, then usually the effects are not very positive though. So that is a difference with the northern labyrinth. Because if you surrender yourself to your subconscious, um, you're generally in a little bit of trouble. The things you put in your subconscious, you put there for a reason. Because you 
dislike them about yourself because you're afraid of them because you don't want to give them power over you or over your life and if you walk unconsciously in a sudden labyrinth and you find all these powers and you allow all these other powers to influence you to get a hold of you then often these subconscious parts will start manifesting themselves in your life and thereby they reveal themselves but they may not reveal themselves in a way that you can control it or that you would like so it is very much a tool but you can easily get lost you can lose yourself in a labyrinth if you're not strong enough if you're not focused enough if you're not able to have the balance between both being stable and being sensitive so the southern labyrinth is a lot more challenging to traverse than the northern labyrinth it's a lot more dark you could say <laughs> a lot more unknown unknowable or unseeable in the northern labyrinth often you find that there's just one way which leads to the center because it is an ascension process often in the southern labyrinth you have an in and an out flow and this is also very different for the dynamic of the labyrinth a labyrinth with only a center is in a way very stale um, so it is not very good to use for healing processes because the energy is not flowing and also in the person who's traversing the, the labyrinth the energy is not flowing it is not conducive to transformation to growth if you have a labyrinth where in a way the flow is continuous there is an in and an out flow then in a way the energy rises and also descends it rises as you go towards the center it descends as you go away from the heart of the labyrinth the heart of the labyrinth is not necessarily the geographical center of the labyrinth by the way it is the place where the object of power is which you are looking for and if you have a labyrinth with many different powers then you can walk the labyrinth looking for a different power traversing other powers to get into a good enough state of understanding to reach the heart so especially if you have an undefined labyrinth with just places of power finding the heart it's not the same even if you walk the labyrinth 10 times you can find 10 different hearts of the labyrinth depending on what you're looking for the southern labyrinth tradition is also very different in the powers which are represented so the, while the northern labyrinth is charged with the powers of egregores or deities often the southern labyrinth is charged with um, say lower vibrational powers so powers of desire of family of karma uh, of fate um, sometimes also the the judges uh, are there also your uh, friends and your enemies from other incarnations can be found and of course these families and friends from other incarnations are often reflected back in the circumstances of your youth your family and your significant others which are ways for if not the same spirit at least for the same principle to represent represent itself in your current incarnation so journeying through the southern labyrinth is very much a journey through your own life to gain more self-understanding I find it very useful especially with this when manifesting a southern labyrinth to do this in a place where there's a lot of nature powers a lot of natural forces because they can easily uh, be used to feed these patterns within yourself to get the life force into these patterns to trigger them so you can reawaken those memories reawaken those feelings and experiences from your past lives for this reason I also like to place water elements in a southern labyrinth because the water is also very much an element 
of the collective consciousness. So you can remember things from all your previous lives, your previous incarnations or from previous places, deeper parts of the history of a house, for instance, can be seen by using the water as a method of divination. So the powers which are, in a way, the cornerstones of such a labyrinth become very different. If you use it as a healing space, you don't always ask the person to wander around looking for the correct spots. Um, you can also just allow the spots to come to the person. So if you use it as a healing space, you can place the person either in a specific spot, because you feel that this specific power is what will aid them, or you can put them in the center then just invite all the different energies which comprise the element, uh, the labyrinth, to come to the heart and to work upon the person who is placed in the heart. Uh, often it will be a series. A labyrinth is not something like a hologram where everything exists at the same time. A labyrinth is traversed through time. But even if you place a person in the heart of it so all the influences can reach them, often they will take turns. So first one energy will act upon them, then that energy will fade and another energy will act upon them, and then another. And slowly the person is taken through a whole healing cycle. And these healing cycles can take quite long, and with quite long I mean days. Um, so it is not uncommon for a person to be placed in a sudden labyrinth for uh, several days or up to a week even. Uh, of course, you, then you have to give them some food and some water so they can, uh, won't suffer too much from being in the labyrinth for such a long time. Um, also, in a way, abandoning a person in the woods is also another way of yeah, putting them in the labyrinth. And especially if you put them in a swamp where you have the water element quite strongly, then often they will be very strongly confronted with their past lives. Um, so swamps are in a way ideal places to have such a sudden labyrinth. Another ideal place is to put people in a cave, where also by being within the bosom of the earth, also within a very collective space where all the energies from all the different lives and places and things come together. So, thank you for paying attention to this series about healing spaces. There's other healing spaces I can go into, but for now this concludes this video at least.